Good evening. Welcome to tonight's On the Edge with me, Theo Chalmers. Tonight's show is two hours long and live. So if you have any questions for my guests during the show, text them to 87778 with the word edge, a space, and then your name, location, and your message. And we'll try to pick up any that really hit the mark. They're all charged at standard rate. So why not get ready to text? Tonight's show features two people whose ideas for a new society were presented to the world in Peter Joseph's film Zeitgeist Addendum, a film which has been watched online by millions. He is trying to launch a zeitgeist movement to change people's perception of reality and consciousness. As part of that idea, he discovered and has incorporated the ideas of an extraordinary 93-year-old thinker who has created a strategy to build a new unified symbiotic world in harmony with nature. This project intends to achieve nothing less than the unification of the human race. It includes the design of new cities, the abolition of money, a new paradigm for living. It is called the Venus Project. I am enormously pleased to welcome two guests here on a lecture tour from their 21 and a half acre research center located in Venus, Florida. They are founder of the Venus Project, Jacques Fresco, and Roxanne Meadows, who has been with the project for 33 years. What a show we've got tonight. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you, Theo. Nice to be here. I'm glad, you're, uh, I'm glad you can make it. And uh, Jacques, if I could start with you. Um, I know you've been working on this for some time, but you are an extraordinary renaissance man, aren't you? You've done lots of interesting things in your life. That I don't know, but I've worked on a lot of things. You've designed lots of different things. Yes, I have. And um, how did you come to uh, conceive of a new society? Uh, during the major depression in the States, uh, I, there were people that bought new houses and new cars and the banks fell. You have to forgive me for asking, which depression, Jack? 1930, 29. That big one? Yes. Yeah, the Dust Bowl and all that. That was the time when I saw 15 million people evicted from their homes because the banks fell, they couldn't pay them off. So they bought, before that, they bought cars and all that, repossessed and people moved out of their homes by the banks and about 15 million was sleeping in every empty lot. I was just a kid then, you know, 12, 13 years old, and I looked around at all these people. My dad was an agronomist, a sort of an agriculturist, uh -huh. and he was one of the first guys laid off, and he tried to get a lot, job, but there was no openings, and he was evicted. Where were you, Jacques? Where? Where? Which New York of... City. Oh, you were in New York City? Yes, in Brooklyn. Okay. And since people were sleeping in every lot, I looked around in stores and they had radios and vacuum cleaners, but people didn't have money. So what good is all that? It seemed to me that our nation was capable of producing all the goods and services and making it available to people, but the government did not. At that time, Roosevelt was in, while Hoover said, prosperity is right around the corner. But those are just words. I've learned then that politicians say things people like to hear. And they, if they're good at it, they can get elected. Theologians say things that people want to hear. They're there, everything's going to work out all right, don't worry about it, the Lord will provide. And uh, that sort of thing is the dependency of people needing that kind of information. But I found out in reading scientific books and journals that scientists do not speak to win approval. If the majority of people believe the Earth is flat, they come right out and they say, this is the evidence we have to prove it's round. Now, they don't say it's a little round and a little flat. Then you get along with everybody. It's not the business of science to get along. So you've made it your business to change people's perception? I try to. I don't know that I can do that. Okay. But, yeah, you, uh, you know, I just, I'm interested in what made you suddenly go from being, say, a designer of helicopters or uh, a consultant to the motion picture industry uh, to basically creating a new world. That's later. That was later on. But when I was a kid, the Depression forced people to ask new questions 
How come there was a depression? How come the banks fell? Uh, they never asked those questions until the depression. And every university had students outside discussing communism, socialism, fascism. They were discussing things because conditions drove them to that. It isn't that people suddenly became intellectually bright. Conditions forced <clears throat> that. So I noticed that. So I listened to Nazis. They had the American flag and the swastika. During the Depression, they were talking about how great National Socialism was. Then I listened to socialists, and I asked questions. I said, how will you prevent corruption? They didn't have any answers. Then there was a guy speaking on communism, mankind united, all kinds of ideas, back to the good old days, uh, people growing their own food. But I was standing in front of a communist, and he said, beat it, son. I was just a kid, because there were mostly adults around. I said, no, I want to hear what you've got to say. He said, why? I said, well, I don't believe what the Republicans say about the Democrats or what the Democrats say about the Republicans. I want to hear from a communist what communism is. He said, you can stay. So after about an hour, I said, I want to ask you 10,000 questions. He said, you'll have to go to the YCL. I said, what's that? He's a young communist league. I said, where are they? And he gave me an address, and I went there. And there were kids about 10 years old to 17. And they were reading Dostoevsky's, Dostoevsky's book, such as Crime and Punishment, 10-year-olds. They were much brighter than the average child I've ever met. And I stayed there for about an hour. Then I asked the questions. How are you going to prevent corruption in the future? They said, well, when that time comes, we'll work on it. How are you going to house the masses? Well, we'll work on that when that time comes. I said, let's start a technical branch and work on those problems. So the lead guy said to me, you're deviating from the teachings of Marx. You'll have to leave. I said, I didn't come here to hurt anybody. I came here to help. I would help any group of people. So the vice president of the Young Communist League got up and said, let's hear him out. And they kicked us both out. So that was the end of my attempt to reach the communists. Okay. Then I... Can I just interrupt there? Because those questions you just asked those communists, I'm going to ask you those same questions later with regard to your plans. Of course. For new society. I want you to. Good. <clears throat> that's, that's both of us then. Okay, so carry on then. Then I... I started, uh, well, I, and, and attending religious sessions, the minister said how wonderful the divine plan was. God makes it rain to make the plants grow. So I raised my hand. I said, why does it rain at sea? So he said, hold your hands out, and he beat the daylights out of me. And, and I didn't understand him. I thought he was kind of a stupid individual. He should have said, well, maybe I never thought of that. That's interesting. So I wanted answers. I don't want to follow anybody, and I don't want anybody to follow me. If what I say makes sense, do it. If it doesn't, get off. To build a following where people admire you, walk around, that's dangerous. Okay. So I don't want to lead anybody. I just want to point out things, such as when World War II came about, being a kid, I just noticed that uh, they were bombing the hell out of each other. Germany was bombing England and France, and and U.S. sent Lindbergh to Germany to see what was happening. And he came back and said, the Germans are turning out 3,000 planes a month, and U.S. had 600 first-class fighting aircraft, and that was not enough to engage. So they asked the aircraft companies to expand. They said, hell no. After the war, we're stuck with a big plan. So they gave the aircraft companies the money to expand. America supported 60% of American industry, built it up. And after the war, they gave it back to them for one cent to three cents on the dollar. That's public funds. They didn't give the public interest in that. And it looked to me very strange. Mm -hmm. And this is what was strange about it. If they conscripted the lives of young men, put them up to defend the country, 
I felt at that time that they should have conscripted all the war industries so nobody makes a buck out of war. If you make money out of war, you sell submarines, airplanes for $40,000. Today it's a million dollars for airplanes. People make a lot of money from war. And I thought that was unfair. If millions of young Americans put their lives up to defend the country, they used to say on television, buy war bonds, that'll bring Johnny home faster. So they should have conscripted all the banks, all the money to bring Johnny home. And I didn't understand how you can make a profit during the war. So I'd like to see all the war industries put on the same basis of pay as the soldiers. The soldiers at that time uh, were men who enlisted for the adventure. I asked thousands of soldiers during basic training when I was drafted, what are you fighting for? What did you know what you... No, they didn't know. Really, they didn't know. And World War I, they had an IQ of 11-year-old. So soldiers never knew what they were fighting for. It's just the medals and the adventure they went into the <coughs> war for. But I asked thousands of soldiers, what are you fighting for? What is, to see what they knew. Did you they fight? didn't know a damn thing. Jack, did you fight? No, I was sent to Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio, for ideas and invention. Okay. The aircraft industry. So they said to me, first thing, they said, can you make a bomb that moves sideways? I said, no, I can only design safety devices. I don't know how to do that. I know how to do that, but I won't. Do you understand that? I do okay. understand, yeah. You were a, a sort of conscientious was... objector, a subtle conscientious objector, were you? Well, no, I couldn't do that because that would put me in prison and get me in trouble. I wanted to get my ideas out in the Army. Okay. So I told the Army men, the top brass, that I was surrounded by, such as a major. I said, I think the war is wrong. And he said to me, you better be good what you say. I said, you've got to give me at least 20 minutes. Will you do that? He agreed. I said, don't judge me till I finish. Okay. Now, I had a friend that was in World War I. His name was Forrest... Uh, Gump? Uh, Forrest Wysong. Oh, sure. And he used to fly military planes in World War I. Okay. And he told me he flew over German munition dumps with orders not to bomb it. He said he flew over eight times. Now, he couldn't understand why he shouldn't bomb it. After the war, there was a book called Arms and the Men. I want you yeah. to remember that. That book shows that how DuPont... Is that Ernest Hemingway? Arms and the Men. Wasn't it? DuPont had holdings in I.J. Oh. Farben. That's who he's ordered not to bomb it. Now, that's <laughs> dirty. Yeah. Fortune magazine ran Arms and the Men years ago showing how different nations had investment in other nations, and so they manipulated things so you didn't... And I thought that was corrupt. That was not good. The war was dirty. Then, in, the world, in that World War II, we were taking all the islands in the South Pacific, shooting Japanese, and telling the natives, they're coming to take your island away. And they showed the natives how to use guns. They didn't care about the lives of people. They care about defending their particular institution. So I went along with a guy named Alexander P. D. Seversky, who owned Seversky Aircraft Factory. He said, we shouldn't build pursuit planes and we shouldn't take the islands in the South Pacific. So I said, what should we do? He said, well, we should build long-range bombers and knock out the power projects in Germany. That'll stop the aircraft factories and everything else. Don't shoot soldiers in the field. He said, that does nothing. If you don't bomb the power projects and shut down the munition factories, you can keep sending airplanes and other things over. But there's no money in that, shutting down the factories. And there's more money in ordering new airplanes. You mm. understand what I mean? I do understand So the what war you mean. looked bad, and President Johnson even, at that time, had holdings in steel material that linked together to make runways on airports. And I knew that the profit system made war un, un, unsane, not mm -hmm. insane. I feel that people were stupid. When you figure out the cost of World War II, not just in lives, 
in flattening out all of Germany. England was bombed flat. France was attacked and bombed. Thousands of soldiers were killed and 400 ships sunk to the bottom of the sea with copper, brass, manganese, tungsten. What a tremendous loss. And then paying the pensions of veterans for the rest of their lives after the war. I think it was cheaper to rebuild the world, build hospitals, clean out the slums, give nations what they lacked. It'd be smarter to rebuild the world rather than train millions of men to be killing machines. That's what a soldier is, a killing machine. And I figured if we send kids back to school to become problem solvers instead of killing machines, how to bridge the difference between nations? How do you get to nations that have a totally different value system than we do? Here's how you get there. It's very easy. The War Department doesn't know these things. They comprise a very stupid men that are concerned with defense only. Here's how you do it. You approach a nation on the basis that they all need the same things we need. Clean air, clean water, arable land, and a relevant education. That means no investment brokers, no bankers, no advertising, just people that know agronomy, geology, structural engineering, physics, science. Everything that you have, your radio, your television set, your washing machine, your refrigerator, is technology. Politicians have no knowledge of anything. They're lawyers and businessmen elected to political office who don't know the fundamentals of how people get to be the way they are. That means if you were raised as a baby by the headhunters of the Amazon, you'd be a headhunter. If you never saw anything else, I mean, no movies, never travel. And if I said to you, doesn't it bother you to have 10 shrunken heads? He says, yes, my brother has 20. Is he a bad guy? No, he's reflecting his culture. So I believe if you were brought up as a baby in Nazi Germany, all you see is Heil Hitler, Deutschland Obo Alice, and all the books are burned, you become a Nazi. Is he a bad guy? No, that's all he's been exposed to. So I do not blame people no matter what they are. I even think that a serial killer is made that way by the environment they're reared in. If you're brought up in the deep south, you're going to speak with a southern accent. And I say, stop speaking with a southern accent. Well, that doesn't work. Say no to drugs is really stupid. Whoever proposed that, as long as there's money in drugs, they're going to sell drugs. Do you understand I that? Do. Jack, I'm going, to, I'm going to have to butt in a little bit. Here. I just minute. want to get Roxanne in the room. <laughs> so, Roxanne, I mean, Jack is obviously a very passionate speaker and right. thinker, and you've been working with him for 33 years. Yes. What's your role? Well, I, I've been working with him and doing everything I can to help this direction because I really think it's the only viable alternative out there. When I heard about it, it made more sense than anything I'd ever heard of. Um, the activists today are upset about what's going on and they're a watchdog of this system, but they don't pose any alternatives. And as long as you don't pose any alternatives, it's the same story. So we're not trying to fix this system. We don't think you can fix it. That's doing patchwork. You, you can't really make this system, the monetary system, just or equitable. They say it's a democracy and you have freedom, but you're really as free as your purchasing power. There really is no democracy. That's, that's a, a word that they get people to go fight and die for, and to us it really means nothing. We don't see how it means anything in this culture. You don't, you know, when people say we're, we live in a democracy and we're a participatory democracy, and we say, well, when did you vote for the space age? Did you vote for the Iraq war? Did you vote for libraries or bridges in any areas? No. You, you vote for who they put up. And those people. And they who, only have two parties, don't they? They have only two parties. To that us, make any, they have one party. Well, you have. Well, they may have, but they have two different names, don't they? In America, you have the Democrats and the Republicans. And they represent Here we have Labor big and business. Conservative and That's right. Maybe the Liberal Democrats right. a little bit. So this is an entirely different system, and we we pose an entirely different social design. We look at what causes the problems and try and design a society that eliminates war, poverty, hunger, crime, and that can be done today, well, but not within a monetary system. You know, it's, uh, 
what you present, a lot of the things that you present are very attractive, and we'll get to some great images, and we're going to show a bit of a film. Yeah. I don't think we've got time in this segment to show the film. Um, perhaps the gallery could tell me. Um, but, uh, no, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, so all these things are very attractive, and the designs and so on um, are, are incredibly attractive for this new world, if you like. But, you know, how do you just, you don't just snap your finger and there's a new world. How, how do you achieve it? It would be nice. But first, like anything else, you have to introduce it to the public, like what you're doing, through, through all the media that we can. We feel that we'd like to present a major motion picture. Peter Joseph did a tremendous job to introduce this to the whole world. And we, we get emails, we get hundreds and hundreds of emails a day and people who want to help. Let me, what I want to do is I want to go to one of these pictures. This is, um, let's get a picture too, can we? This is a, a picture of some of your architectural ideas for, uh, for a new world. There we go, it's on that screen there. Oh, it's gone again. Yep, there it is. So these are, Jack, these are some of your ideas, are they? Yes. And you've designed these buildings? Yes. I mean, they're stunning buildings. I would be very happy to live in either one of those two, for instance. Well, actually, they're all transitional. There's no final architecture or final frontiers or final city. Even the best city I design will be a straitjacket to the kids of the future. They'll design their own cities. And if you make a statue of me, that holds back the future. So, yeah, there's no more self-ego involved. Most architects design tall buildings and feel proud of it. They should design buildings for living, comfort, safety, earthquake-proof, fireproof, termite-proof, and architects don't do that. They're all little personalities that seek recognition. You don't fight for recognition. You fight for elimination of the problems. When people are saner, they will not want a Nobel Prize. Because if you work on cancer 10 years and I read your book and find out what didn't work, and I come up two years later, I win the Nobel Prize. I feel that everybody working on cancer works just as hard as you do. So I don't think there should be Nobel Prizes. They should work because they believe in making life better for people. Well, I've, got to, I've got to come back to this same question. Right. Now, how, do you get, how do you get the world to change? You know, assuming that your ideas are acceptable to the majority, sure. and I'm not sure that they are, we'll get to that, yeah. but assuming that they are acceptable to the majority and everyone finds them attractive and you were able to disseminate these ideas all around the world and, and everybody bought into them, the you know, question. what I mean, how do you get to that point? How do you get to the point where everybody the buys into The question is how do you get from here to there? Yeah, and how do you first, stop the people who are really in power? I understand. From now, first, clinging on to what they've got. First thing that has to happen, they have to have an economic problem. That's what happened during the Depression. That's when socialism, communism, fascism all emerged. But we've got that now, Jack. We've time. got an economic We're in that process now. But I don't see We're, anybody going, oh, let's get rid of money. Wait a while. We're nearing the turning point. See, now all over the world societies are breaking down and politicians don't know what to do. They gave the money, I'm talking about America because that's where I came from. They gave the money to the people that created the problem in the first place. Then they bail out the automobile factories when they were going broke. They didn't even want to close the plant, and they bailed them out. The automobile companies never submitted a blueprint with a car better than Toyota, faster than Toyota, better built at a lower price. If they don't submit that, and the public doesn't have purchasing power due to losing their jobs, who the hell's going to buy these new cars? Well, they're, they're, they're giving cash out. for clunkers, as they call them in America, and we've got a scrappage scheme in the UK as well. So yes, all over the world, all governments are corrupt. Did you get that message? All, uh, <laughs> all of them are corrupt. Okay. Communism, socialism, all of them. Fascism. So I felt, is there another way to operate a government? And I sat down, I began to design the society Jack, of the future. I've got to cut in there because we're going to go for a break now. If you'd like to text in your questions or comments for Jacques Fresco and Roxanne Meadows, why not do so now to 87778 with the word edge and then your text. We'll see you back here very soon. Welcome back to On the Edge with me, Theo Chalmers, and my special guests, Jacques Fresco and Roxanne Meadows. Um, Jacques, um, just before the break, we were talking about how we can achieve this utopia, if you like. But what I thought we'd do now 
is just show a bit of a little film that you've made. Yes. If we can. So if we can go to that film, and I'll give people an idea. Uh, this is only transitional pictures of what the future could be. Not what it will be, I don't know. We may kill each other because I'm very much against the space program. If any one nation gets out there long enough, there's going to be nuclear weapons going around. We're not wise enough yet, nor are we civilized. As long as there's prisons, police, armies, navies, we are not civilized. When the world joins together and agrees to use the Earth intelligently, I'm talking about the whole world, that'll be the beginning of the civilized age. There's no such thing as utopia. Every city will continue to grow, change, just as your laptop undergoes change. There's no final frontiers. That's bull. That's written by Hollywood hacks. Movies on the future where they burn each other with laser weapons and robots choke the designer. That's Hollywood hacks. Has nothing to do with the future. Politicians have no way of dealing. That's the city of the future, one city. The universities design buildings, and people live in them, complain and bitch about the lack of how fast the elevators move. My grandmother can't get out of them, and we change them till they work very well. And at that time, we move the buildings out there, the concert halls and all. After put to test, the city has everything in the middle, medical care, dental care, and the shopping where goods are available to everyone without a price tag. There's no money anymore. The reason there's no money is because drug companies pay off radio stations, television stations, to pitch their drugs. The drug company doesn't tell you if you drink carrot juice, that'll lower your blood pressure. There's no money in that. So they make pills. So I'm saying that all of the industries are price system oriented, money oriented. And if that's their orientation, I don't trust them. When a doctor says your kidney has to come out, we don't know whether you're trying to pay off a new boat or whether your kidney has to come out. So I don't trust the monetary system. So here we show buildings being assembled automatically by machine. You don't need laborers anymore. You don't need young girls standing behind counters. We can design machines to move 20-story buildings, float them out to the site, and with one pound of force, we can move a building a ton of weight. So the round city of the future will put every district the same distance from that center building. And the center building has everything that people need. Well, I mean, that's, uh, that looks absolutely incredible. And I'm, I'm sure it would be great. I think there probably isn't a person on the planet who wouldn't think that looks great. But I've got to get back to that question, sure. which we were interrupted absolutely. by the break. And that is... How does it happen? Okay. How does it I'm happen? I'm going to try to answer that. If I fail, you have to let me know that you didn't Well, I think that. people, you know, a lot of people are texting in already. A okay. lot of, uh, 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 let me just read out a couple here. Um, this gentleman should be president of the world, really. Kind regards, Morris Wilmot. You are more than an inspiration. You are a motivation. Thank you for your light in a dull world. Extreme emotion. Uh, that man should be in power. That's Aidan Doherty in Straban in Northern Ireland. Um, but then Bob in Whitehead says, how does it work without money? Who goes to work? What do you do? Okay, you ask me that now? Yeah. Okay. The way it happens is the system has to fall. People have to lose confidence in their elected leaders. I have no control. At that time, when they try to solve problems and it doesn't work, then the public will say, be looking for new ideas. They don't give a damn right now. As long as they're working, paying off their home and car, that's all they're concerned with. Only if they lose their jobs and their homes do they begin to look around for new ideas. So what we want to do is make a motion picture called And the World Will Be One. And that motion picture is about a family in the future, how they live, their lifestyle, and children six and seven years old that are different than our children. No Mickey Mouse clubs or Cinderella or garbage that they get in school today. Children can learn math, they can learn anything at all. And the children are bright and they ask their parents, how did we get to a world without war, without crime? I want to know in detail. So father says, didn't you get that in school? He says, only a little bit. And the kids say, we want to know exactly how we got from this old world of chiselers, bankers, fraudulent 
uh, in social institutions, propaganda. How do you get from the old world to the new one? And the father starts, says, that's a long thing. Didn't you get that in school? They said, not enough. I want detail. I want to know. So he sits both children down, and he starts talking, and the camera goes back to the present day, where there's unemployment, protest signs, don't cut down the forest. As long as people buy lumber, they're going to keep cutting down the forest. The stupidity of walking around with protest signs doesn't work. The, you see, the liberal points out to the shortcomings of our country, but does not offer an alternative. Communism, socialism, offers no working alternative. But isn't your future a bit like a communist world, from each according to his uh, ability to each I according to his buy needs? That. No, That's there's the money. They, do, they use money in communism and socialism. Okay, well, they how have does it, elite. How does it work? They have stratification. They have politicians. It's nothing like that. They're for the labor class. We're for eliminating the labor class as soon as possible through automation and technology and people can go back to school and do what they want. But okay, well who's going to design the buildings then? That's a job, isn't okay. it? Okay. The Who, buildings are already designed. But okay. you just said they're going, those buildings will evolve and if the lifts don't work uh, and granny can't no, get to her exercise class. We build the first city and that city has the planners in it first. The planners and the people that work out the details. The second city we level some of the old cities and keep some of it as museum cities to show people how people used to live. We level the old cities and mine it for the iron, glass, and other materials and recycle it back into new cities that are fireproof, earthquake-proof, and there's no automobiles. There's circular elevators that take you anywhere. Here's where I got the idea. Radio City, New York, the Empire State Building, takes a million people up and down and never crash into one another. So we turn the elevators out that way. So you dial where you want to go, the art center, music center, just like an elevator, and it takes you there. Putting people in automobiles is a stupid thing. More people are killed on the highways than war. And you say drive safely, those are words. We don't have drive safely. During the transition, the automobiles have a sensor on it. So if I'm 40 feet away from your car, if I got mad at you, I couldn't hit you. The sensor would stop my car. That's what I mean by intelligent management of the Earth's resources. Politicians cannot do that. They don't understand technology. Today, the problems are technical, not political. As soon as people get that through their heads, if they do, they'll understand that war is the most corrupt supreme failure of nations to bridge the difference. You have a Pentagon in Washington that defends this country. Well, what happened to Pearl Harbor, we gave them radar and the kids detected the enemy planes coming over. And they called their captains, says, probably our planes. What the hell good are these people if they don't know how to defend it? Then the people that couldn't afford armies hijacked two airplanes and flew into the uh, trade centers, you see. And we never said, why do they do that? How can we build so much hatred in the people? What did we do in the past? Nobody seems to know that. Well, Jack, a lot of people who watch this program believe yes. that it was the uh, American government that flew those planes a into conspiracy. the world. conspiracy. Yes, a conspiracy. I don't buy that, but I think that American government is stupid. They do a lot of stupid things, but not that stupid. So you don't think, you think that I was... I don't buy the conspiracy. ...some thing. people with box cutters who hijacked those airplanes? I don't buy it. Okay? Okay. Next question. All right. Let's say, for a moment, uh, looking into the future, that uh, everybody on the planet goes, Jacques, that's a great idea. We'll stop making weapons. We'll start building this new utopia. Don't Who's in that word, utopia? Okay. It implies a final state. Okay. Well, this, this, this Venus project idea, okay? A better means a, of living. A better means of living. Let's say everyone adopts your idea for a better means of living. Exactly. Okay. Who's in charge? Okay. During the transition from the old monetary system to the resource-based economy, which you didn't ask me how the new economy works. We'll get to that. During the transition, there will be trouble, crime, murder, everything you have today. If we get to the point of automation as we want it, I then believe that when people have access to the necessities of life, they do not steal. If you made a public library where anyone can get a book, 
That's wonderful. But they fought the women that marched for that. They threw rotten eggs at them. Let me finish. They threw rotten eggs at them. All the trouble you have for every bit of change, of social change, there was always a minority beat up, put in jail, you know, for the difference. So I'm saying this. If you do that, you hold back the future. You should not be afraid of ideas. Listen to all kinds of ideas and reject those that you feel won't work or question it. But you didn't answer the question, Jack. Who's in charge? Okay. During the transition, the people that have studied the Venus Project and how it works are not in charge. You're asking me who makes the decisions mm. and who has the right to make decisions mm. and by what authority. Mm. Does the public participate? Is it a democracy or is it a dictatorship of technology? It's not a dictatorship of technology. I want to say this because scientists are just as dumb as everyone else. They're part of the same institutions. They write books on why man can't fly. The Wright brothers never read their books, so they built a flying machine. Edison was a nothing, and he gave us many things. So don't think the establishment gives you ideas. Some American develops a new carburetor in his garage, and he sells it to General Motors. And General Motors says, and now General Motors brings you. You don't know where that came from. When I worked for Douglas Aircraft, everything I thought of belonged to Douglas and the North of Division. Did you know that? Well, yes, Even I'm when I went home and thought of ideas, it belonged to them. I can understand how that and works. And that, to me, is corrupt. Okay, we've talked about that. And I mean, I like the way you think you've got the great ideas. will be trouble. But, Jack, you've got to answer the question, who makes the decisions? No one. Here's how it's done. They are under the orders of a scientific group, the Venus Plan, which is written out. What they do is take samples of the soil, say, from all over England, and it goes to central agriculture. There they analyze the soil, and by the contents they say it's best to grow apple trees with that soil. That's not an opinion, that's a finding. No more opinions, no more what do you think, what do you think. But we measure. Yes. Who decides which scientists make the decisions? I am proposing a system. This is a Scientopoly, isn't it? This is a... No, if people agree upon this direction, which is using the scientific method applied to the social system, which means using science and technology to improve the lives of everyone and the environment. Today, when there's, mon when there's money in it, the bottom line is money. And the, it's not for the well-being of people. They don't really care about people. It's for the bottom line and for industry and for certain people's advantage. But in the resource-based economy is what we call it, then the bottom line is the benefit of people. So you don't make, first you take a survey of what we have all over the world. This is a global system. So you take a survey of what we have in resources, technology, personnel, and, okay, who, and who, who is decides sick. that we take a survey? Who, we are who laying out a direction. The survey? Who we puts are, the, the, the decision Venus project into... is. If people go along with what the Venus Project advocates, which is the benefit, the betterment of humankind, then we have a process level as to how to um, feed, house, and clothe people all over the world. When you want to make a bridge, you don't go to Aunt Minnie, who has a pastry um, restaurant. You go to people who make bridges, who have a history, and who have experience in that. And so, people, but they don't have say in the government. They, there is no government. They don't have say in the direction of society. We lay out a direction, and and. And that's our, our end goal is to make a better world, make people creative, make people the highest potential that they can be, change school systems for that, and um, use the intelligent management of the Earth's resources. So how do you do that? By people who know how to build bridges. You go to people who, who, can, um, who can house people. You go to people who can make low-cost houses quickly using um, clean sources of energy, make them energy efficient, make them go together quickly. We're not looking for architects who build out of ego. We're looking for, uh, for the end problem, which is to house people. All right, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to the point of the resource economy and, the, and no money in a, in a minute. But I, I, but I still want to, I, I, you know, I'm sorry to labor the point, but I'm, you know, the, the uh, devil's advocate here. Okay. And I still don't understand 
who decides to do stuff. And it's all very well saying, you know, bridge builders build bridges, house builders build houses, or machines build houses directed by house builders or whatever. I understand but your question. who is in power? Okay. The who Venus is in Project power? designed a procedure for attaining a future. If the majority of people want that, it'll happen. If they don't, it won't happen. So and be if democracy, they decide then, so that they want it... So it's a majority vote, is that what you're saying? No, if the majority can understand the procedures of the Venus Project, they may or may not understand it. I can only present the way to deal with problems. Because people come to me all the time and say, can you make three-dimension movies without glasses? I've done all that. I've designed artificial legs for doctors, hospital equipment, surgical instruments. But if the guy didn't have the money, he couldn't buy the artificial leg. So I didn't like that. And I said, Jock, you've got to design a society that works. Don't spend your time on invention. So I said to myself, how do you know your system will work? I says, I don't. I learned that from a scientific method. So I said, why don't you put your system to test? So I joined the Ku Klux Klan in Miami and dissolved it in a month and a half. Then I joined the White Citizens Council alone. They hate foreigners and dissolved that in one month. Then in New York City, I said, what are the, some of the most backward people in the area? The consensus were the Arabs. I said, what makes you think they're b backward? They still believe the earth is flat. So I said, boy, I better get in there and try to turn them around. And if I can't turn them around, I can't change society. Not a theory on paper, a nice little utopia where everything works well. That's BS, bad science. So I'm saying to you that I called up the Arabs and I said, can I meet with you? I called up the head of the Arab group. There's always a head of the Ku Klux Klan. I called him up. And I said, I'd like to speak with you. He said in his accent, you are Arab? I said, eh, yeah, I'm not an Arab, but I speak a little bit of many languages. So he said, from where did your father be born? And that means, you know, where was your father born? So I said, in Lebanon. He said, very good, come and saw me, it means come and see me. So I came to see him, and he said, you believe the world he round? I said, yes. He went, that means it can't be in his terms. Then he pointed to his head to show me, he held up his hand like this, he said, if the world he down, all the water fall me down here. All the people, they fall me down. I thought he was doing a good job for a non-educated man. What, what year was this, Jack? This is about 45 years ago, 50 years ago. Wow. So I said to him, uh, I said, I've got to change him, because that's important. So I gave him a rubber balloon, which I brought with me, and I rubbed it with fur, and I put cornflakes in his hand and told him to hold his hand 10 inches away or this far away from the balloon. And if you rub it with fur fast, all the cornflakes jumped up yeah. and his jaw hit the pavement. And he said, world he magnet? I said, eh, ah. And he went and explained that to all the other Arabs. It took an hour and a half, I turned them around. So I found out how people think, where they get their ideas from, and approach them on their level, not mine. So, Jacques, yes. I'm sorry, I'm going to keep That's pushing right. this until I get it. an answer. But I want you to. Good, because you did ask me before we started to push you on points that are important, and I think this is a really important point. So, let's imagine for a second that you make your film and everybody goes on the website, everybody loves what your, your ideas are, and they all say, we want this, we oh. want this Venus project to and be the reality. To it. Yeah. So there they are, happy for it to happen. Is it you that makes the decision? What happens next? I wrote a proposal for a new type of society, criticizing and showing possible alternatives, such as you've got signs on the road, drive carefully, slippery when wet. We put abrasive in the highway so it's not slippery when we're... We, don't, we show them Jack, those Jack, alternatives. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you keep coming up with great ideas yes. for things. Yes. But you're avoiding that issue. Who makes the decisions we in this world? We put out the proposals if they agree with that and support they it have economically. A vote, People have a vote. Is that what you're saying? No. Do, does everyone have a button in their living room? Yes or no? It comes on the television. We want to do this. We want to build a farm here or we want to build a block of flats here. Yes or no? Is, it that, is that it? No. No, that's not, not it. Not at all. So how is it? How do I, if we've I'm a citizen already, of this planet, we've already how worked. do I affect my life? 
We already worked that out. That doesn't have to be done anymore. We put the proposal up before people and they say go. That means they have to support it economically during the transition. Look, we have there, to build... There are, there are a lot of people today talking about a better wor world in flowery terms and say that we need a change. We can't go on with what we're doing. We're going to pollute the, the earth. We're going to kill ourselves with bombs. Um, but they don't pose anything. They, nobody says, how do you get out of this? They're just beginning to ask those questions and say, we need to do something else. Jacques has asked these questions in 1929 when the, he saw the first the, the large depression. Hmm. And it is then when he started to look around and say, this does not work. There are things in store windows, there are technical people, there are farms, there are people that want to do things and make things, but people are thrown out of their houses they, because the world is still the same place, but they don't have any money in their pockets. It's the rules of the game that we play by that are screwed up. So he proceeded, when he was a young man, to to devise another system that would work for the benefit of all, that would house people, that would clothe people, that would make them creative. That This today is, a, is an established society. Many, many years ago, many people became comfortable and then tried to freeze things and keep them as it is. The society that we are proposing is an emergent society. It's not fixed. It's not frozen. Jacques laid out a direction to work towards in city planning, in transportation, and, and across the board where never, nobody else was working on that. And it's not a fixed society. It's an emergent society where things are growing. That's why he doesn't like it to be called a utopia, because that's like we've made a final society, and this is it, and you can't go any further. His society, can you imagine turning science and technology and all, all scientists and say, how do we build a better society? How do we eliminate accidents? How do we, how do we make clean sources of energy? How do we turn science and technology over to make things better for people. That's not what we're about today. Okay, well, these are all good things. Let, let me read a, a, a few texts out. Um, Brenda and Hull says, it will be a form of communism. You will never get away from someone who wants to dictate. It's because he knows nothing about this system. Okay, Rob Keenan Wigan says, Jack, just say that you will make the decisions. I would be happy for you to do that. Aidan Doherty says, as long as there is power, evil people will want it. How do you stop them? Vina Tritek has proposals for government operations in which there are no people in government. Oh, here we're getting to it they now. Didn't know that. Okay, no, no people, people in, government. in government. So who makes the decisions? I'm going to show you. Good. Okay, so we have a computer with electrical tentacles into the soil. If the water table drops, that pumps water out there. If the nutrients change, that machine pumps nutrients out there. Nine months ago, a computer was developed that can handle 1,000 trillion bits of information per second. No group of humans can do that. So we move humans out because the future world is so highly technical, no human being is capable of handling trillions of bits of information input per second. Only computers can do that. So man is being put out. If you don't understand me, go to your supermarkets, you'll see new checkout machines where you pitch a card through and they're moving Jack. people out. Jack, I'm sorry. We're going to go for another break now. Be back here soon. Once again, if you'd like to text in your questions or comments for Jack Fresco and Roxanne Meadows, please do so now. See you back here very soon. Welcome back to On the Edge of Me, Theo Chalmers, and my special guests, Jack Fresco and Roxanne Meadows. Right, Jack, just before the break here, you were saying, and I think I've understood this correctly, um, you were saying that computers will make the decisions. Well, what we call cybernetics, computers operate machines. If you go to an automobile company today, you'll see robots putting the wheels on and everything. The people are being moved out. Do you understand Yeah, that? but I don't want the robots telling me what wheels I want. 
The robot's telling you what? What wheels I want. The robots can measure things better than you can. Yeah, yeah, of course they can. But, but if, we, if we hand our power to a bunch of robots, Come on. That's like, a dystopia, not a utopia. You've seen a lot of lousy movies, like exactly. 1984, Brave New World, Atlas Shrug, is written by Hollywood hacks, and they don't know how machines work, so the robots choke the designers. That's Hollywood, not reality. But, uh, but I don't think, well, I'm not ready to have a robot make my decisions for me, and oh, I don't I think, you know... Check you... that out. Let's check it out. Okay. All right. You don't turn a generator to keep your lights going, do you? No. You assign it to robots because they can do a better job than you can. Now, in the early days, a pilot used to look out of an airplane and say, I'm about a mile high. Today, the Army took that decision away from pilots, and they have Doppler radar, which hits the ground, bounces back, and says, you're 5,300 feet, three inches off the ground. No human can do that. No, the Eurofighter, for instance, What's can't that? be flown by a human being. It has to be flown by Still. computers. It's, it's yeah, so unstable. It will unstable. be in the next 10 years. Well, that's the case now. It's, they, they, they've got people in them, The pilots. Army is flying planes automatically. But the pilot still has the last word, doesn't he? The pilot says, no, we're, we're going no, that way, we're going no. up, we're going down. No, the mission is the last word. In other words, they have guided missiles, and the guided missiles are set to hit a given target, and they are smart enough to sense metals and everything else or go up the rear end of an airplane. Okay. It doesn't if, need to be steered by people anymore. So what All if the computers decide that there are too many people on the planet? No, oh, wait, what's your question? What well, do you do with overpopulation? No, no, that's not the question. The question is, what if the computers decide that there are too many people and the food supply won't I, feed I, those I people? I want to answer So that. would they say, oh, let's kill a few? I will answer, answer that. Computers do not do that. Computers and scientific machines are, are really extensions of human attributes, but they have no feelings. Machines don't care. If you destroy a de laptop in front of 40, they're going to say, we're going to get you this month, but next month for sure. They don't care. Don't so, you understand so that? Are you saying That's then a human that, projection. Jack, are you saying then that computer programmers will rule the world? No. Not at all. They're under the guidance of the Venus Project if they agree. If they don't agree, they won't support it. If you, if you have a cavalry in Poland, like in Poland they believed the cavalry was the most important thing, and the Germans believed war tanks were, and they slaughtered the hell out of the Poles because they couldn't get past that point. If the American and English people and French people don't realize what I'm talking about, they'll be blown to smithereens by their own stupidity. We are lousing up the air and the oceans, and that we know that politicians don't know what to do, because I've asked them. I've asked every politician that I've grown up with, and so what do you do about this? How would you stop cars from hitting each other? How would you stop building from burning. I don't know. I don't know. They don't know what to do. They're businessmen okay, let me, and, let, or lawyers. Let me read a couple of texts here. Paul in Warrington says, wouldn't a new society need a leader or do we lead no, ourselves? No leaders. And what if a person went against the grain? Who makes law? Okay. We feel that people go against the grain because they've been damaged by society. In other words, if you have two children, I'm a great believer in environment shapes values. I believe that the dialect you speak, your facial expressions, you learn. Women move a certain way. Oh, did I see a gorgeous hat? And if a guy is brought up by women only, they'll move just like that. If you're raised in Italy, you say, come on, they eat. It's a good food. Is that an imitation? No, that's the product effect that environment has upon people. This is nature v. nurture, isn't it? The old argument. Yes. Now, nurture, like in Othello. It's, it's, they think that human nature is a certain way, most people, because they're brought up that way. Actually, there's no such thing as free choice. When, if you ask an Eskimo, what do you want? You can have anything you want. He doesn't say a stainless steel refrigerator. He can't say that. So if you ask an impoverished person, what would make you happy? A steady job, maybe, and a good car? What the hell do you think he can say? He can't pass that that his society superimposes upon him. When you're very young, the society starts pumping stuff into your head. What's the greatest country in the world? I don't know, the good old USA, if you're brought up there. And who loves you more than anybody in the world? I don't know, your mommy and daddy. So they pump all that crap in your head, then as you get older, there's a Mickey Mouse Club, all crap. 
And as long as you start filling the heads of kids with crap, you're hurting the future. So kids can learn geology, continental drift, space science. Kids can learn anything. They don't need to be members of the Mickey Mouse Club. That's socially offensive. So what you call decent people today would be considered criminals in the near future. The, the supreme justice of the Supreme Court will be considered a criminal in the future. Why? Because there used to be a definition of a criminal, and that definition was one who removes a thing from your house or your person without your permission. Today, they've changed the definition. One who's caught, which is much better. Well, let's okay. talk about money. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about money. There isn't now, any money in our society. That's the question. Yeah. Okay, this is a, uh, an economy based on what's available. Yes. Not money. Not money. So let's, well, let me ask a question yeah. then. Say I'm living in this society. Yes. And I've got an old car. Yes. And I want a new car. But I don't just want any new car because I'd quite like to have something a bit nice. I believe, I how understand. do I get that? Here's how and you and get does that mean somebody else doesn't get okay. that? If she drives an old beat up Volkswagen and you drive a Mercedes, if her brakes fail, you die. So we have no old cars. They weigh as much as a new car. So we reprocess them and turn out the best cars America can turn out. Let me explain that further. Okay. The soldiers in the U.S. Army Air Force don't get any beat up old planes. They get the best the nation can turn out, the best machine guns, the best radar that we can turn out. Why don't we do that in times of peace? Why don't we give hospitals whatever they need? Right, electron, electron microscope, MRI machines, whatever they need, give it to them. It's based on resources. Money is a nothing thing. If you were shipwrecked on an island with $10 million and your wife had gold and diamonds and both, and there's no water, no arable land, no fish, you have nothing. Money is a nothing thing. It's a made up story that supports certain groups of people and they call it the Federal Reserve System, which is not federal law. It's as federal as the federal laundry. They don't have, it's not a government thing. The public is deliberately uneducated to understand how things work. In America, when we had slavery, if you taught your slaves how to read, you were fined. Do you know that? And in Salem, Massachusetts, they burned women who disagreed with certain aspects of the Bible. Well, they burned them they as witches. They burned them as witches. Yeah. Now, did you know this? That the guy that found those women got their possessions, their books, their house, their car, their horse and wagon. Did you know you accumulated their possessions if you pointed them out? I didn't know that. That's the, but that should be I, in our history. I can't book. say I'm desperately surprised. I mean, that, well, that just shows you that there are... Corrupts. But man has the capacity to be evil. No, if brought up and, in and, and, and even in sorry, I've got to say this, even in your let me prove vision, to you that it won't. wouldn't there still be people who are evil? No, that's a, that's what they teach you today. That's not your ideas. This system cannot go on unless it points out you can't have a system where everybody gets everything because there'll be jealousy, rage differences in personalities, some people are hardworking, some are lazy. That's the crap they give you, which is not true. I'm going to show you how people get to be the way they are. I mean, I, I, I love all these ideas. Everybody can have whatever they want. Machines are doing all the work. This yes. is, you know, this... you go back to school to learn something useful, a new profession. But, but there are people who are just naturally sociopaths. Not so. That's all Surely. folk ways. That's not true. You don't think there are naturally evil Even people? that I don't think they are, I'm going to explain how they get to be that way. When you've got two children, if you play with the young one, and the seven-year-old stays there, you'll notice that lower lip. Or, 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 if you're playing with the young one, you're making jealousy and envy. I always take my older child, put him on and my younger child, and say, this is your baby brother. I do never use one child against the other. Why can't you put your dishes away like your sister does? You leave everything spread around and I have to pick up after you. If mother does that, she makes jealousy and envy amongst the children. Women will have to go back to school to learn how to raise children. Now, you're taught in school that plants grow. I'm sure you were. Mm -hmm. And you're taught in school that everybody should have a right to their own opinion. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Suppose you lived across the way from me, 
and I see ten guys coming out of your apartment, and I have a right to my own opinion. She could be a ballet instructor, language instructor. Never give people the right to their own opinion. If their own opinion is sane, and I say, what's going on there? I honestly don't know. She could be a language instructor, a ballet instructor. But if you give everybody a right to their own opinion, you think man will ever get to the moon? Nah, not in a thousand years. I'm not interested in that. Are you a rocket expert? Do you know anything about space travel? I don't want your opinion. You know, if you have a society as it is today, and you have few nations and few people controlling most of the Earth's resources, you're going to have war, you're going to have poverty, you're going to have stealing, you're going to have crime. And then you make laws and try and make people ethical and say, don't steal, and you put them in jail and you call them evil if you do that. In the society we're talking about, you produce abundance as quickly as possible and you make goods and services available to everyone. So you eliminate the need for stealing. So you change what you call human nature. It's really no human nature. You change human behavior by making goods and services avail available. So you don't have to make laws don't steal. You don't call them evil because they steal. You get this good and bad, right and wrong from religion. But if you change the environment, you change the way people behave towards one another. If you make goods and services available so they don't have to go to work at jobs that they hate, and people who have minimum wage, they have stress up to here, they have to take days off to take their kid to the hospital, because they can't afford medical care in the United States anyway, in a good part of the world, then you have people who have stress up to here, and it's easier to try and steal, and they would call them evil. You know, you're not born with bigotry or prejudice or envy or, or being mad. I have no doubt that if you were to give people whatever they wanted, there would be less crime, but there would still be crime. People would have affairs and the husband or the wife would find out and kill the husband or the wife. Yes. That would sure. happen. So you During would still have crime. Yes. What, well, after the transition, yeah, nobody would have affairs, no you. one would get jealous, no one would I'm kill anyone? I'm about to explain that to you. Okay. When I was 21, I worked my way to the South Sea Islands. I want to know what people would be like if they weren't brought up in civilization. When I got to Tuamotu, when I landed there, I brought mirrors and beads. I was going to give it out to the natives mm -hmm. to establish friendship. I come as a friend, mm -hmm. not to take anything away from them. But they were already in my hut. Three hours after I arrived, giving out my mirrors and beads to one another with a great big grin. Well, Gogan did to that, them, didn't he, in the 19th century, and he gave them all syphilis, you know. Now, I said to them, well, how come you're giving my stuff away? And they said, you've got too many, too many things. I didn't understand that until three days later, when the old people pulled in a net full of fish, they threw fish to anyone standing there. They didn't say, you owe me five bucks, you owe me seven bucks. They just gave you things. And they were completely nude, those people. And I never saw a guy on the island stare at a female body. They were swimming nude ever since they were that high. And when they made love to a female, they had no fetishes. They stroked the whole female. Do you understand? There were no tit men, leg men, ass men, what you've got today, all the damn variations and fetishes because women and men have been separated. If, if everybody in America had a nose a foot long, you'd have surgery done. Do you understand what I mean? People would run down and say, she's a funny girl. There's no such thing as beauty. If you bring up people to believe in all this artificiality, you damage their lives and make it almost impossible to function. Love does not exist. Okay. Let me explain that to yeah, you. But let me read you a text quickly, because it's going to scroll off the screen and I'll miss it otherwise. Carol says, we would have a new higher consciousness in a new world. Your questions are coming from the ego of this society. That's obviously addressed to me. Yeah. So perhaps she thinks, you know, this is, I'm talking from the old world and you're in the new world. And, and, I, and to some extent, I can understand that. I can, I can see that okay. a lot of people okay. would be positively affected okay. by this new okay. world. Okay. Here's the real story. Okay. When I was a kid, I designed an airplane miniature and it crashed into the ground. And an older kid came over to me and said, your wings are too far back, move them forward. I said, how did you learn that? 
He says, well, I built one, and it crashed, and some older guy told me. He didn't say, my plane is better than yours. That's the ego thing. My plane is better than yours. Kids, I can run faster than you. I can fight you. My daddy can lick your daddy. Where do they get that? In the competitive system. So I learned by sharing ideas, you both gain. If I attack you and say I can run faster than you, I always said to kids, you probably can run twice as fast as me to get them off my back. And a lot of people want to hurt you, they'll say, where did you get that shirt? In the Salvation Army? That's an attack. But if you say, I found it in the reject pile of the Salvation Army, there's nothing further they can say. But if you have to understand the grammar of motives. Nobody ever read that book that I talked to called The Grammar of Motives, Mind in the Making by James Harvey Robinson, The Tyranny of Words by Stuart Chase. All those books should be in every university. They're not because they, they upset the culture. So there are nice people in the Heritage Foundation that remove books from libraries that they think rock the boat. Jack, would you abolish religion? Never, because it will go underground. You have to educate people out of it. What we're but trying don't to do is make a anybody. society that, that where all the wishes and aspirations of religion and the highest teachers are made into a reality. I don't see how any religious person would be against what we're doing. Okay. You know, in, in heaven, they don't have money. When you, when you do something, they don't say, OK, you can have this, and you get, owe, me, owe me so much interest. So okay. we're trying to make a heaven on earth. All right, well, somebody texted in a little while ago. It scrolled off the screen now. But they said, why not set up a political party as a starting point? Have you thought about because doing this? Humans have tried that all through history. But you have they started a movement. Became corrupt. You've started a movement, haven't you? The Venus Project is a movement. You know, a I, movement I think it's not a bad idea, really. Toward education only. Politicians are there to keep things as they are. They're not there to change things. If you want to be heard in politics, you have to create a lot of money in order to be heard on the media and other places. And then you owe people things. So it's not a political movement that we're after. This is not a political system that, that, we're, that we are advocating. OK, well, what about I, another text I had in a little while ago that, again, it scrolled off, but they said, uh, you clearly don't believe in 9-11 as a conspiracy, but do you believe in the Illuminati? Do you believe that there are people who control this world yes. and have a secret agenda? Yes. And, OK, they've got everything already. Yes. They're not going to be in love with your idea because no, they've got not. everything. They're not. And, and we're their what slaves. Do you do about you know, we're that? their robots. Is that your question? What do you do about those in control that, is my question. that run everything? What's the answer? Here's what we do about it. The automobile industry failed. It closed down, and they can't sell the factory anymore. It, becomes, it goes into the hands of the government. The banks fail during the Depression. We bail them out. If you don't bail them out, this time they bail them out. But it's not going to work out. It's going to continue downhill. More and more unemployed. Obama doesn't know how to solve problems. He may be sincere, but he doesn't know what to do. So as things go downhill, industry, one after the other, will fail. Meaning, if you, a friend of mine owned an aircraft factory, this is true, his name was, the very name was Berlin the Joyce, and the, the government came and said, we're taking over your factory, this is during the Depression. He said, why? Because you haven't paid taxes on your damn equipment in three years. He said, I had no orders for airplanes in the Depression. I Take the goddamn factory. Don't you see? If you make computers and she comes up with a chip ten times as fast as yours, you can't even sell your production equipment anymore. It's obsolete. So I'm saying we're in a new kind of time where things are moving much faster and there's no adjustment. Politicians, which is an old system, our language was designed hundreds of years ago, so we can't talk to each other anymore. We talk at each other. We say, have a nice weekend. Why don't you say, have a nice life? Why just a weekend? Where do you get all that crap from? You get it from the society you're raised in. Kids are competitive because they have to run faster, be on a team that outpaces another. And I never worked that way. I never worked. I shared my ideas with others. And the smarter other people became, the richer my life. So the smarter your kids, the richer our lives. Every kid shooting up drugs, hanging out in gangs, you know where kids hang out today? In malls. There should be art centers, music centers, cultural centers for kids. Because the higher the quality of the kids, the richer the life of the nation. 
You know, you technology that? is racing forward, and it's, it's cheaper today for industry to automate. There's no air conditioning, no people that you have to pay, no salaries, no insurance that you have to pay. It's even becoming cheaper to automate than to outsource today. There are many factories at almost 100% automation. So as, as soon as there are more people who automate, and they have to, to, to stay ahead of the competitive edge, then that means that people will not have jobs and they will not have purchasing power to buy the goods turned out. That alone, with many other scenarios, is the end of the free, free enterprise system, these are, the monetary system. These are all wonderful ideas, that, but you still haven't explained how you defeat this Illuminati, which you believe in. Yes, I think it exists. So how do you defeat them? Because Here's they how. don't want your new Here's world how. order, they want their new world order. All right. Whatever they do will not work, the Illuminati, because their ideas. If, they, if you don't update your factory methods, you go out of business. If you're a nice guy and you own a factory and you don't like minimum wage, and he pays his help ten bucks an hour rather than five dollars and sixty cents, then he builds a playground for the children of the women that work in his place. He's a nice guy. Nobody's going to invest in your plan because they want the bottom line going up. Well, That's where they have invest. succeeded with so that. If you're kind a nice guy, no. you won't succeed. If you're a son of a bitch, you will. And you'll succeed in the monetary system. But you will have to outpace other companies. If you can put in, you know what industrial spies are? Like Douglas Aircraft puts people in Northrop, they pay him to see what Northrop is doing. And if you don't outpace them, come out with cheaper planes, better built, you go out of business. So the giants are getting larger. The small businesses are folding and automating, and they themselves will go out of business due to the fact that they're not operating in accordance with natural law. Now, here's what I mean by that. Man makes all kinds of laws and signs treaties with other nations. We violate most of the treaties we sign. So do other nations. If it doesn't suit their interest, they will violate it. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. It doesn't say some people. It says, thou shalt not kill. Jesus chased the money changers out of the temple. They're all back in now. And people say to me, you're trying to make the world a better place. My world is up there. And I said, you forgot the Lord's Prayer. Jesus said, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's no business in heaven, no private property, no money, no banks. You understand? They don't even understand what they're reading. Mm -hmm. They're uneducated people and don't know how to assimilate. So they give people intelligence tests to see how intelligent they are. There's no such thing as intelligence. An electrical engineer of 75 years ago couldn't get a job today. Do you understand that? Yeah. He was intelligent then. There's no such thing as a civilized nation. No nation is civilized. As long as you have war, crime, prisons, police, when people are properly educated, you find that we learn gradually. There's no fixed final frontiers. Everything changes. And we prepare people for social change continuously. That's why they don't say fresco cities is the best. That's an ego thing. I don't care. If you come along with a better design for a city, I get the hell out of the way because you can make my life better. You see, ego is when you cling. You say, hey, I'm the president of this organization, and I'm proud of it. Pride is one of the seven deadly sins. So you see, mm -hmm. what I want, it isn't what I want, it's what I've been working on for years to try to eliminate ego problems, to try to talk to architects about safety, elevator, fireproof buildings, and if I die, great if you carry that out. I don't give a hoot about a medal or a medal for... for doing certain social Jack, things. Jack, I'm just going to read out one quick text and then we're going to go for the break. I wish I had your hope and I'm 40 tomorrow. I don't know who that's from. Right, we're going to go for our break now. Um, once again, if you'd like to text in your questions or comments to Jack Fresco and Roxanne Meadows, please do so now. Just text 87778 with the word EDGE and then your text. See you very soon. <laughs> Welcome back to On the Edge with me, Theo Chalmers, and my special guests, Jack Fresco and Roxanne Meadows. Uh, just before the break, then, we were talking about um, 
how it might work, but I still don't really have a great understanding of what exactly is the Venus Project. Okay. The Venus Project is an approach to the problems we have today and a possible solution. What the Venus Project really says, if you don't want war, if you don't want crime, if you don't want sneak attacks, if you don't want highway robbery, serial killers, what you must do, if you don't want those things, is declare the Earth the common heritage of all the world's people and take away all the artificial boundaries that separate people and share the resources of the Earth what is needed is the intelligent management of the Earth's resources. But when few nations control the water, or control the energy, or control the resources of the world, there's always going to be invasions, troubles, wars, depressions, unless you do these things. You don't have to agree with me. Think about it and see if you can find fault with it. I'd be happy to learn how to make it better. And I'd be happy if you have constructive criticism. But if you say that'll never work, that doesn't tell me anything. When a teacher says that's wrong, it doesn't tell children anything. So would it be an end to country states, you know, cities? Yes. Ci uh, sorry. Yes. If states. you don't do that, you're going to have trouble over and over again. Wars are getting worse. Universities are better equipped than ever today and the wars are getting worse, the bombs are getting worse. We have 300 submarines in America. Each one has more destructive power than all the wars in history. Now what the hell can you accomplish with that? You have to be extremely stupid, naive, to build that sort of thing that'll wipe out everybody on Earth. Well, maybe there are other motives for building it. You know, maybe it's about profit. Maybe it's about controlling the planet. Well, maybe maybe America's... I know what it's about. It's about that trying to get the resources. Where do you think Americans got America? They stole it from the Indians, the Mexicans, the Spaniards. After they stole all the land they need, they put up the sign, thou shalt not steal. Well, they bought some now, of it from the French. that's the same for Britain. They <laughs> said the sun never sets on Britain. Where the hell did they get all that land? They took it by slaughter and killing. Well, they, hold on, they bought, they bought some of it from the French. They bought some well, more look, of it from the Russians. Most nations are corrupt. All of them are corrupt, not some of them. I have no doubt that's also the case. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you're saying abolish all countries, one world I'm not government, saying that. one world I'm government. I'm not saying that. I said we're putting out the Venus Project as a possible alternative. If the world people decide to join, we will share resources. If some nations won't, they won't decide to join. So they don't get the benefit of this total global system. Okay, well, Sue in Cornwall says, when will Venus be built? That depends on how much work you do, and if you like the Venus Project, how much work you do, and what people do. Roxanne and I have no power at all. We merely submit a possible alternative. It's up to people to say, I don't think it'll work, and it won't work then. Jack, if people I mean, identify with us, then go to our website, thevenusproject.com, the Zeitgeist Movement, the UK Project, where we're gathering all of the scientists and technologists who want to help, all the CAD and animation people. There's, there's a website called www.thezeitgeistmovementuk.com. That's one of yeah. the main ones, isn't it? And the zeitgeistmovement.com and the venusproject.com. The, the Zeitgeist Movement is the activist arm of the Venus Project. Jack, you're 93. I hope you don't mind me saying that, since I said it in the intro, and I know you don't mind saying it. Um, do you think you'll see this in your lifetime? I don't think about that at all. I do the best I can to try to make it possible. If people don't recognize it, I've done all I know how to do. I have no... Uh, I'm not psychic. I just deal with probability. The probability is that we'll kill each other, that we will not achieve that, because the, the, the rate of damage is increasing. We're polluting the oceans, fish are dying, whales are dying, the atmosphere is being poisoned, the water table is raising, rising up, and the rate of damage is so fast that we don't have enough time to wait for people to become smart. We want to make motion pictures to help people understand not what Fresco likes, but what the conditions are today. It isn't me that's saying I want to control people. I don't. No. But I've taken a lot of time out 
you know, I'm 93 years old, and all I do is work on problem solving, not pointing out this guy's a crook and that system isn't working. What do you do about it? That's all the Venus Project is about, making airplanes safer, cars safer, education for everyone, whether you got money or not, medical care from birth to death, doctors that are brought up to feel good because they see the end of poverty, hunger, slums, not a doctor that works for money. Uh, I don't trust those guys. I've got to say, a lot of texts we're getting in are very positive about you. I mean, a lot of people are inspired by it's you. It's always been. Uh, since the Zeitgeist a lot of people movement, are thanking you. Sorry. Yes, excuse me. Since the Zeitgeist addendum introduced this direction to the world, we have a lot of people out there who are working towards it, in every way that they can. How how can people? If people want to support right. your they dream, they invited us to China to talk about the Venus Project. For me to design new cities, new buildings, everything. That's why. So Roxanne and I went to China. They gave us return tickets and they treated us with the red carpet and all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we found out that I was supposed to speak to 1,500 students in their universities. It never came off because the guy that invited us out there ran away with the money. Instead of giving people return tickets, they caught them in Las Vegas. So I never got a chance. Then they invited us to Iceland to tell what the Venus Project is. They gave me seven minutes. This I is not happening now, minutes. though. People are asking Jacques to speak all over the world. Well, you just been to Copenhagen, there, haven't you? That's right. We just came from and a very large out, lecture in Copenhagen. Jacques is asked to speak in many universities all over the world. And Saturday, They're, this weekend, he's speaking at the City University in London. That's right. Two, two lectures. Two, yeah. two times. You can go on to our... Well, actually, all the tickets are all sold out for both lectures. Okay. After this, we, we go to Mexico in a couple of weeks where he's being... He's doing another keynote speak. Uh, lecture, and he's he's uh, getting an international design award for 2009, and then we're off to El Salvador for a two-day seminar about the Venus Project. So people all over the world are trying to introduce this the best that they can. Every single month, we we're in, in a new beautiful magazine, a, a very large spread with all of Jacques' designs in them practically, and. Um, all except for the United States. They are not touching it. But let's, all over the world, they're doing Let's look at another bit of your film. Because uh, this is about, uh, well, perhaps, Jack, you can talk over it once it starts. Uh, I think this is to do with living at sea, isn't it? Can we get that film up now? Please. Pretty OK, please. you want me to describe it? Yes, please. Here okay. we go. In the future, instead of taking one container off a ship, at a time, the ship costs over a billion dollars, it ties it up for three days. So we, the whole container section floats off the ship. That gives you three times the carrying capacity. All those ships are showing the whole container section removed off a ship, rather than one at a time. That's how we raise the standard of living of everybody, quickly. Bridges will be designed with single cables. This was designed a long time ago, this film. Today they're beginning to do that. All bridges are prefabricated and assembled in prefabricated methods. The trains, as you see, are suspended beneath the bridge. This is cities in the sea. The function of cities in the sea is to rebuild the reefs. Of course, the United States Army, 40 years ago, dumped 65 tons of nerve gas off the coast of Miami. How can you love the country and do those things? So we want to build these cities in the sea for oceanography studies, reclaiming the reefs, and cleaning out the garbage we've been dumping into the ocean for years. That has nothing to do with ego at all. Yeah, not to yeah, mention bikini level. at all, What's where that? you set oh, off all your nuclear how weapons. How stupid can you be? Well, yeah. what, I anyway, have let's no get back power. to... Sorry, I, Jack, these are back. industrial plants at sea for mining. Uh, the oceans are filled with resources, pharmaceuticals, and earthquake cities in the sea that are floating will house thousands of people in some cities hundreds of people. It will vary. Is this underwater? This is, instead yes. of putting fish in aquariums, we will have underwater observation where you can walk through tunnels, look at the reefs. Some people want to live in floating domes on the lakes with a glass bottom so you can see the bottom. You don't have to live in our cities. This you is, can live wherever you want to. This is a helicopter in the middle of that platform that you see. And all the ships, and those are fish farms in the sea. 
You can't keep taking things out of the ocean without putting back into the ocean the necessary ingredients for promoting the fish. We just selfishly remove things from the ocean. We pump up the soil so plants will grow twice as fast. This is a world fair, and it's not for entertainment. It's for taking normal people, normal means mixed up, and putting them through a system that shows them what the problems are. Not entertainment. Disney World is entertainment. Is this like re-education? When they go through it, no. Oh, when they go through it, they come out smarter. They learn new things it's... that they've never heard. Houses will vary. I don't know what the future will be like, so I've designed many different types of buildings for art centers, music centers, bridges with towers, offshore living. Like I say, the houses will vary. The airplanes will vary. They'll have no ailerons, no rudders. They'll discharge electrons in the wingtip for banking. When you cut into the structure to make flaps and ailerons, you weaken it. And the hydraulic lines fail, you die. So here you have space and the earth, a beautiful gift we got, and we're lousing it up because we're not wise enough to use our technology intelligently. That's what the Venus Project is about. It has nothing to do with what Fresco wants. It has to do with what is possible. First, we do a survey of the Earth to see what exists, how much arable land, how much factories we have. And then after that survey, we maintain a population that's in accordance with the carrying capacity of the Earth. If you don't do that, if your population keeps exploding, you're going to have mass starvation, hunger, territorial disputes, unless you maintain a population that's relevant to the carrying capacity of the Earth. Nothing to do with Fresco. Do you understand? Fresco has nothing to say. He gathers that information. Are you in favor of reducing the population of the planet, Jack? Not by force, by education. But so people would breed less? Yes, education. Okay. Understanding what the consequences are. All right, let me now, read Now, I want to tell me, you something. Let me read out a cover of text, because you'll like these ones. Uh, Roxanne Moore says, the Venus Project is genius. Couldn't agree with Jack and... Oh, sorry, and Roxanne Moore. I'm sorry, that's not her name. So, uh, Carol says, 93 and sharp as a button, you're an inspiration. And here's one, I don't know who this is from. It says, a worthy vision, a genuine real start in the right direction. How do we survive the transition period? I'm sorry about that, but the transition period will be painful. And if we get enough support, it'll be easier. But it's not an easy task, moving from a monetary system to a resource-based economy. There's going to be trouble. I'm sorry. I have no control over that. Okay. We, as we said, we would like to do a major motion picture to introduce people in an entertaining way what this future could be like. And at the end, we'd like to have people walk out and say, why don't we build this today? We'd like to give them something to advocate that's possible and that's positive for the future of it, for everyone. Since and then we'd like to build a first city, a planning center, where people can come and look at it and see how it works. And then people from different parts of the world could go and build one in their, their country. So how, because you didn't really answer the question before, how do people get on board? How do they get on board? Oh, they write us, they send us letters and say, what do you want us to do to help this? And what do you tell them? We tell them to become familiar with the Venus Project, look at our website, and then hold meetings at your churches, at clubhouse, wherever you belong. The Venus Project is not about architecture. It's about a way of thinking. And if people learn this way, we're more apt to have a greatly improved world. It's not perfect. It's just a hell of a lot better than what we've got. We're asking and if you people, don't understand that, I'm sorry. We're asking I people. I can't twist your wrist. I can only tell you that we are capable today of producing such an abundance. Don't take my word for it. Go to Sears, any department, you'll see lots of stuff. What the hell are you selling things for? If he gets a dental infection, a dentist makes 1500 bucks. If somebody dents your car, he makes money straightening it out. We're all predatory in this system. In the other system, we're all for humanity and the protection of the environment by all nations. It cannot be done in America alone. If you do it in America or England alone, and the Russians and Chinese do nuclear experiments, they contaminate the ocean. We must invite all nations in so that there's no powerful group that controls anything. So, so all the nations sit around 
in a circular auditorium a dome about 40 feet in diameter, and they talk together about the planning center. So the Chinese say, I see no place for recreation, and that occurs. It's an architect. And somebody says, yes, but what do you do in a hurricane? Well, the steel corrugated walls that slide instead of you nailing up panel boards. It shows all those things. What if a guy doesn't want to live in your city? Say he's a member of the Amish Somebody people. Somebody asked that question, yeah. actually. The Amish people, like they would want to live in it. So we help them build. We'll build a city for them, but it'll be of fireproof materials. But if the Amish people say, we like wood, then you're responsible for fire or whatever you do. If you don't follow our plan, we don't hurt you, we don't remove support. But isn't that a bit totalitarian? Isn't it a bit do as we say? No, we don't say that. We say you just did. if you, just you said... join with us, we will share resources. If you don't, you, you have to be responsible for what you choose. If you say you want a swimming pool, we'll build it for you. But we will recommend lifesavers that can go out from a person and say, help. The lifesaver goes out and helps them right away. You say, I don't want that. Well, that's up to you. If you don't want anything we have to offer, you are responsible. But we will help you do what you want. All churches will be free to practice whatever religion they want, but they don't pass the hat around anymore. We support the churches and everything else. It's up to you to turn things off. So I want to say we don't have a democracy. We never had a democracy. In a democracy, our president would criticize another country. When he was two, we'd invite the prime minister of that country on the air for an hour and a half, same time the president had. When we'd invite the prime minister of Sweden, he said, they're both wrong. This is how I see it. That's a democracy. We have every point of view. Well, you've got military people on television talking about the war. Always military people from the Pentagon, politicians that are pro-war. You don't get any views from social scientists, sociologists. That is managed news, and we don't care for that. Okay. You understand? Yes. Fresco's voice is not the only one. You have every other point. We never build a city until a group of people come in called the study of the negative retroaction of any project. When you build a dam to generate electricity, the fish can't get to the spawning grounds. So we build stepped systems where the fish can work their way up to the spawning ground. You just don't build a dam to generate electricity. Now, the computers will tell us that five years after that dam is built, the water table is going to change 20 miles away because you cut off the tributaries. And that will stop the beavers from building dams and trees will die. We can't do that. Computers can. So I want to use computers to assist human life, not to operate warplanes and machine guns and laser weapons. That's the wrong thing. Do you know that there's a project under the mountains for all senators to go to in America? I'm sure. And it can support them for three, six months. What do you come out to? A burnt out radioactive planet? What the hell good is that? Me, That's no solution to any problem. Let me read another text. It's, this one, I don't know who it's from, it says, have faith that people are more enlightened and maybe more receptive than in the past. And they say, this is in capital letters, build it and they will come. This is like Field of Dreams, isn't it? So, build it. Why not build it? Why not get people to we give did. you the we money to build it? We built a research center. We built a research center in Venus, Florida, where we built hundreds of models of dams, power projects, bridges, and, and can real people buildings. go and see this? And real yes. buildings. I know there's we a film on your tours. website, isn't we there? We have tours, tours. on but our it's website. Not, it's not quite like that, though, is it? It's not quite like the film No, we, we have built 10 buildings. We have hundreds of models where we shoot videos. And, um, you know, you're asking about what people can do. They can help in any way that they can. If they can write articles, if they can get lectures, if they can help financially. We want to do this movie. We want to build a research center. We can't make it happen. We don't have the funding. But if people cooperate, then we can do more. It okay. just depends on what other people do. Well, talking it's about not cooperation, up to us. There's, there's a guy here called Rob in Wigan who's asked this question several times, so yes, I'm going to read it out. Please answer this question. How do you get over the language barrier which can cause conflict by misunderstanding alone? Yes. So how do you do that? This is true. So there is a language that's not subject to interpretation. When you read the Bible, he says, Jesus meant this, and you say, no, he meant that, and he says, you're both wrong. So you got the Lutheran, the Seventh-day Adventist, the Catholic, because it's subject 
to interpretation. There's a language that's not subject to interpretation. What's that? Mathematics, structural engineering. When engineers talk to each other, they say, believe me, this is strong. They give you the tensile strength, the torsional strength, the compression strength. So they talk about things in the world, not words. But people can't even agree how the World Trade Center towers collapsed. I'm sorry, that's the way they All were. All three of them. Misinformed. I, I didn't make that world. I'm just saying there is another way. Physics, mathematics, chemistry does not cater to old beliefs. It gets out and says, by the way, your notion about some guy creating people and turning them loose in a beautiful garden and then snakes that walked upright came and said, eat of the fruit of knowledge. That's a terrible thing to tell people. That Noah, that two kinds of every animal, if he did, the ship would have to be a mile long. Who cleans all the crap out of that ship? In other words, the stories are so fabulous and stupid that people that follow that have never been educated. I've got to say, I've always had a problem with that original sin idea that I was born with somebody else's sin. That's yeah. right. You know, you it's bet. like, I don't mind committing my own you sins bet. and being responsible, but right. having somebody else's sin was kind of, yeah. you know... Well, anybody that follows religion could be sincere but naive. I don't say religion is corrupt. It's based on lack of knowledge. Now, God says, if you don't follow everything I recommend, the Ten Commandments and the other thing, you burn eternally. Now, that's not God. That's a psychopath made by man. Mm -hmm. Man makes God in his own image, a jerk that creates floods, disease, starvation, but he loves you. I've got to say, Jack, I find it very, very easy to keep the commandment about uh, coveting my neighbor's ox. I've hardly ever done that. You don't need to do that in the future. <laughs> You don't need to do that because we don't kill animals. What you mean? We're all vegetarians we in your new experiment world. On, no, I'm not vegetarian. No, no, but in, in your new, you in know your what Venus project, oh, no, I've got to ask this because I like eating meat. You know what nanotechnology? Is? I do know what nanotechnology. Taking atoms Lots and arranging them in whatever molecular structure you want. The nanotechnologists tell me that 15 years away from it. So we can so make a steak, steak without killing. They'll a, be able to make a, steak a or anything you want without mining it anymore. We stand up for tremendous potential. Science but isn't, isn't like always GM perfect. food, and I'm not that keen no, on that. No, not at all. No? No. Things would be grown organically in the future. You're not allowed to genetically engineer plants unless you put it to test over a long period of time, making sure that it doesn't hurt people. That and before we build any project, profit. we shave off the topsoil. It takes a thousand years to make one inch of topsoil. And these jackasses put a building right above thousands of years of rich soil. We shave off the soil, put it in soil banks. We use the North and South Pole to store surplus food in case there's an earthquake in Japan. We don't have to go to school and say, bring in a box of oatmeal or a can of beans for the poor Japanese. We will use the North and South Pole for food storage. The people in government don't think that way. They make laws. And 90% of the laws that man made are to control you. That's what religion is all about, control of people. So instead of making laws, we solve problems. That's the difference. If you took every soldier and sent them back to school and made them problem solvers, what a wonderful world we would have instead of killing machines. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do understand. I don't somebody said to me, what if somebody came along, this is their language, that was 10 times smarter than you, what would you do? I'd get the hell out of the way, because they could make my life better. Ego is when you cling, and you want your recognition. Jack, we've got, to end, on that. We've got to end on that thought. That is all we've got time for. Thank you to everyone for watching our special two-hour show, and for those who texted. And thanks to my very special guests, Jack Fresco and Roxanne Meadows, who will be giving a lecture at City University London on Saturday. If you want more information, please visit www.thezeitgeistmovementuk.com. Next week, we'll be back with yet another exciting show that might even change your life. Until then, remember, they're watching you, watching us, watching them. Cheerio.